Lord, for the manifestation of your word. Thank, thank you for you, your Jesus. kingdom, thank Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this prayer. And each and every one of us cover us under your blood and give us complete victory. And everyone that is connected to us, bless us the same. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name. In Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. God bless you. Uh, steady learn. God bless you. We are so thankful to God for this privilege. And I'll just read a passage of scripture here, taken from Ephesians chapter 4. Just the last few verses from verse 29 to the end. Uh, Ephesians 4. And it reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven you. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. And that was put up also. So I just want to give God thanks. And it means that I see that. Scripture was put up, so I believe it's Elder Collins. But let me just, you know, say before I hand over to Elder Collins to introduce our presenter to, uh, tonight. You know, it's, uh, the, the, we know it is a series, and it's uh, the last, like I said, of the of the Bible study for this year. And so we just want to magnify God and, you know, being committed to submitting. You know, you have persons that are committed to so many different things. But when you are committed to, to, to being sub, submissive to Almighty God, it's the most powerful thing that one can actually do. So we are thankful to God that we've come thus far. And at this time, I'm just going to be handing over to Elder Collins, and he will share some other things, obviously, before he brings on um, Evangelist Mitchell. God bless you. Glad to have you. Well, God bless you, Pastor Marx, and let me greet everyone in the lovely name of Jesus. Again, it's such a privilege to be able to be a part of this broadcast, this program. Amen. Such a privilege to see all God's wonderful people that are on, expecting more to be joining in very short order. Hallelujah. What a blessing it was last week. I mean, it was not the usual jump and shout, but it certainly was soul searching for me. Um, it really caused me even that night to, I retired pretty late. As a matter of fact, it was in the morning. I retired just, just musing on the word, the, the importance of being committed to submission as far as submitting to God is concerned. So tonight I'm expecting nothing less um, we believe God is going to be using his servant uh, again tonight in a most powerful way by, well, I don't know if I want to say by way of announcement, we, uh, or the one, this apostolic ministry is grieving at this moment over the loss of one of our pastors, a man who passed suddenly just yesterday. Um, so I do ask um, and crave the prayers of everyone that is on this platform for on behalf of the Willis family um that's pastor Willis family pastor Willis um suddenly passed yesterday and the entire church family is in mourning as well as his immediate family so uh whenever you do go down in prayer do remember the Willis family amen so I want to also greet um, Ella Sharp and, and uh, Evangelist Coda and just about everyone. Pardon me if I don't call you by your titles and whatever, you know. I greet you as a child of God, a saint of the Most High. The highest calling that you could ever have is that of a saint. I greet you in Jesus' name. So without any further ado, amen, I want to bring... 
um, in at this time, Evangelist Kerry and Mitchell and the Holy Ghost. It's over to you, my dear, in Jesus' name. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Bless you too. Sir, bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the Lord. God bless you, Elder Marks, Pastor Marks. God bless you, Elder Sharp. God bless you, Evangelist Nakoda Korodas. I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. There are some persons on from the Kingdom Connect, the secret place of the Most High Ministry. I want to greet you all. And I want to bless those of you that were on last week and came back on this week. We bless you in Jesus' name. So I'm going to be asking Evangelist Koda if you're there to come on over and to greet us and to pray, please. Lord, may me a house, may me a house, may me a house of prayer. Oh Lord, yeah. may me a house, may me a house, may me a house of prayer hallelujah. hallelujah i greet us all in the mighty name of jesus our soon and coming king i greet our elders elder sharp elder collins elder marks hallelujah glory be to god you lady make sure i greet you in the mighty name of jesus and just about every one that are here with us tonight we thank the lord for another privilege to be in his presence glory be to god in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hands there are pleasures forevermore father in the name of jesus hallelujah it's a privilege just to say father it's a privilege Village just to Lord God I'd be able to stand before you, God, in your presence. There is fullness of joy, and at your right hands, there are our pleasures forevermore as we come tonight we want to celebrate the king the king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle hallelujah you are a battle axe lord Marco Shanda, mighty man of war hallelujah the lion of the tribe of judah you are the way maker as we come tonight god we come tonight jesus to hear from you and so god we consecrate our minds our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our bodies, the elements of our beings, and we ask that you will take precedent and preeminence. Breathe upon this woman, God, hallelujah, as you have alone heard to us, Lord Jesus, another time. We ask, Lord God, that you will minister to our God, Lord God Almighty, let the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus, speak for Practically, we need every knowledge, Lord Jesus Christ. Release it unto us in the name of Jesus. We bind principalities and powers. We bind the operations of air. We close the portals. We close the breaches. We close the exits and the entrances. We declare, we declare that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper against our God. We bind our God with them spirits, Lord, and we cover our devices. We cover our thoughts. Lord Jesus Christ, let the will of God be done here tonight. Let somebody leave my kosha and the Messiah feeling good that they were here. Lord, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you see me jump off, I have a preacher also. So God bless you in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We say amen in the name of amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I'm just going to sing a verse of this song. Hallelujah. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. Oh, yeah. You mean more than this world to me. Yeah. I wouldn't trade you. For silver or gold, I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, you are my everything, my God. And I feel like singing it one more time. 
You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, Hallelujah. you are my everything. everything. Glory be to the mighty name of Jesus. Thank That's you. how I feel about my God. Thank Hallelujah, God. Jesus. I love him. I adore him, Thank I God. magnify him, and I bless him. He is everything to me. Hallelujah. For some people, it is a slogan, but for me, it is life. There is none other to me like Jesus Christ. And so I salute him tonight. I honor him tonight. I worship him tonight. I bless him tonight. I adore him tonight. I lift him up tonight. You are worthy, O exalted Father, King of glory. Wonderful way maker, peace giver, joy sustainer. God, you are everything to me, Lord God. You are my all in all. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you, God. God, hallelujah. Everything, Lord God, is who you are to me. And so I thank you tonight. I worship you tonight. I adore you tonight. And I magnify you tonight. Glory be to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. So tonight, we are basically going to be going over what we what was taught last week but i must advise you that there has been some additions there may be some things that you will hear you will be hearing tonight that you did not hear last week you know i i don't think it is possible for me to teach it exactly the same way as i taught it before because there are some other things that will come up and there are others that may be left out but nonetheless, we are back on the topic committing to submission. And I want to take my time with it this week because I recognize that last week, you know, it was a lot of information and it was really going fast. And so I want to take my time. I want to greet you all once more. I specifically want to call some names. I want to greet uh, Brother Alton Redway. Thank you for being on tonight. You know, just today you were in a funeral and to be on tonight, it means a lot. The Lord God bless you, Sister Veneda. Thank you for praying. The Lord God bless you, Sister Keisha, Sister Valerie Slu, Brother Yuan Se, and Sister Tash. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. All the others that are on that belongs to this ministry. You know, the elders that I've greeted already, those of you that are on Facebook, I greet you all in Jesus' name. So let us just continue. You know, last week I spoke about the fact that I felt led by the Spirit of the Lord to begin with a prelude. And so this is a prelude to our teaching. The seed you sow in commitment to God is yourself. So it is not time, it is not money, it is yourself. It is a painful journey when you are committing to submission because it is done, it is not done ignorantly. It is done with all knowledge. You intelligently decide to commit and submit to God. However, when your will completely dies, God's will precede you and you have to come in agreement with him. Then you will have strength and ability as Acts chapter one and verse eight says, after that you have tarried in Jerusalem, you shall be endued with power, right? Tarry until you be endued. Remember when Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. And, and an angel from heaven strengthened him. His will broke. And so his DNA released self-will, but retained submission. So in Adam, there was self-will that was retained when he ate the fruit. But in Jesus' bleeding, sweating blood, self-will was broken. And what was retained in the, the, the DNA that 
we now have is submission. All right, moving forward. We had looked at the week before preceding this teaching, generational curses. We looked at the fact that the Hebrew word for curse is aror, which means to remove the presence of God. This act then causes the individual to be restricted, to be bounded to his or her own limitations and imaginations, which demotes him or her from their position of authority. So you're no longer in a promoted or elevated place. You are demoted, you are falling back. That's what happens when you come under a curse. Therefore, to curse someone is to demand that God removes his protective covering. It is a legality. So if you are under a generational curse, you are then under a curse, which means that the presence of God, the protective covering of God is removed from your genealogy. A curse can only be passed on by a superior or person of authority. Therefore, it can be passed on by a father, a mother. They can curse you, an elder, a leader, a judge, a prophet. In other cases, it may be a witch, a warlock, or a sorcerer. They can do so when they have been given legalistic advantage. That means they are able to operate through somebody of authority, right? or they're able to manipulate and gain some kind of covenant or some type of ties. Now, the child of God is designed to reproduce. That's what we had looked at when we looked into generational curses. That is the inheritance of the sons of God or the church to reproduce. That's our inheritance. We therefore are to increase and to multiply. Let's give an example of this. When Adam, when God named Adam, Adam spoke to Adam, he was actually speaking to all mankind because within Adam would have been man. The very name Adam means man. And that is why in G, um, Genesis chapter five, you see that every other mankind that the Lord God formed, he named them Adam. So they became the generation of Adam. So at Abraham, when God changed his name from Abraham to Abraham, he became the father of many nations because he is multiplying. God doesn't look at just one person. He looks at the grand scheme of things. So if God is speaking to us today, he's not just talking to me, Carrie Ann, but he's talking to the church. If he's talking to you, Elder Chris or Elder Sharp, it is not just us as individuals, but the Lord is actually talking to us as A, a multiplicity, a, an increase, a reproduction, right? So it is not just one seed, but multiple seeds. All right, we look at Rebecca. Within Rebecca was two nations in her womb. Remember, she had twin, but the word of God says that it is two nations. So again, the inheritance of the sons of God or the church of God is to increase and to multiply. So when you know, you're cursed generationally, you are finding that there is a ration. Generational curses put a limit on our increase. It rations our abilities. For when the presence of God is removed from an era of our life, it will suffer a deficit. Imagine if the Lord God had changed Abra Abraham's name to Abraham and he was then demoted. He would no longer be the father of many nations. But thanks be to God, such was not the case. The man Adam was a seed carrier. He typified Jesus, while the woman was the conceiver, the womb typifying the church. Remember, Jesus is a word and a spirit of truth. We then are to come in him and allow growth holistically in our lives, which should touch all the systems of the earth and people thereof. We looked at the fact that generational curses affects ages, which also means season, and offsprings, which also means seed or children. It affects them through name. It affects them through blood tie, both of which are considered covenants. Therefore, a more superior blood than Adam's blood or man's blood and man's name or Adam's name is needed to break 
the curse of a generation. Since curses is to demand the presence of God to be removed from a person, it then requires the presence of God to break that curse. And that is why the name of Jesus, which is above every other name, the blood of Jesus, which is above every other blood, and the presence of God, which is life, is what is needed to break generational curses off of an individual, a family, and so on. As believers, we must commit to submitting every part of our bodies and era of our lives to God. And it is a daily work. It is not something that you can do one time and it is done. No, because generational curses, it translates to traits and to genes, which translates to behavior, uh, characteristics, personality. Right. So after a while, you don't just behave that way. It becomes a part of you. And so in order for us to commit to submit and remain free of this curse, we are required to do so daily. Generational curses can also be soul ties, a tie to another other individuals so through an oath or covenant you find that with adoptions through marriages things that require some sort of a oath or a signing of a document it's a legality or even spiritual marriages or covenants with spirits and entities that results in divination familiar spirits and initiation in wizardry or witchcraft some people might think it's strange, but you do have persons that goes out of their way to build hexagons and rings of fire to invoke spirits and to go into some spiritual type of a ceremony. These are what wizards and witches does, and it is all in a bid so that they can have power in the dark realm. And spirits may be able to manifest through them and they are able to put bondage upon communities, individuals, churches, families, businesses. It can also be through sexual acts between two or more parties, right? So generational curses can come that way too through a sexual act. You, you, you become tied into the spirit of the person because remember the act is not just a physical one, but a spiritual one. It may also be through masturbation, which is an act that looks singular to the naked eyes, but it involves incubus and succubus spirits, which is actually one spirit with two different sides, kind of like a coin, a head, and a tail. At one side, it's a, a female. At the other side, it's a male. So it's a, a neutral kind of a bafflement, kind of a LGBTQIA plus two kind of thing that we are seeing, right? It's a, a transitional kind of thing. It doesn't really pre present itself in its true form because whatever sex it's going after, it appeals to the loss. It also involves vain imaginations because you have to use your thoughts to try to conjure up an image and it also involves fantasies, which means that your thoughts are bringing you over into some, you know, some very uh, erotic things, right? One of the things I want us to remember is that your words are life and death. And that is conceived in your thought. It was first a thought before it was a word. Likewise, your behavior is influenced by your thought. You had the thought and then you acted out the thought. That is why masturbation is such a dangerous thing because you are putting yourself then in a position where the spirit of lust is now taking you over and it wants to lay claim to your seed, to your future and to the operations in your life. So these things become then generational curses. It's not just an act to relieve yourself like they want us to believe. It carries a spiritual connotation. There is a reason then why Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord and in his generation and the rest of the world did not. And this is where I want to stick up in for a little bit because as I was going over, some things came to me on this part. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 to 10, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, notice that the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually because the thought and the heart, the emotion and the will, the emotion and the intelligence, the emotion and the cog cognizance, 
they are all wrapped up together. That's what makes up the mind, right? And that's what is called lev in Hebrew, all right? And verse six, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart because their imagination was continually evil. And so it started to produce evil behavior, evil inventions, evil operations. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. And the creeping thing and the fowls of the ear, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Why the beasts? Why the creeping things and the fowl of the ears? Because man represents these systems. Man have dominion over these systems. And if man now is corrupted, then it means that it, corruption has found its way in other things. And remember, when we looked at this, we spoke about man coming from the, the dust of the earth. And so the earth came under a curse because of Adam as well and Eve. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's mercy, that's, that's favor. Listen to what verse 9 says. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And in verse 10, it says, And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It names his generation. But this is where I want to read. Verse 8. Verse 9, sorry, in the Orthodox Jewish Bible, version of the Bible. This is what it says. These are the tall dots of Noah. Noah was an Ish Zadik and Tamim, Tamim among those of his time. And Noah's Alaka was with the Ha Elohim. No. Let me give you some definitions. The word tamim, T-A-M-I-M, -M, that word means blameless. It means it is also translated as perfect, finished, or complete. So Noah's generation was perfect. It was blameless. And again, I want you to take in the context from where this scripture is taken. God was talking about the fact that the sons of and the daughters of men were given in marriage to the sons of God. It was an unholy union that was corrupting the very gene of those that were being reproduced or generated on this earth. And so Noah is the one now that God looks upon his generation, his genes that he's reproducing, and God finds it blameless. The word Zadik means righteous. It carries the meaning of doing what is correct and what is just. So when the Bible says that Noah was a just man, it means that Noah was a correct man. He was doing, doing the things that pleased the Lord, that was good, that was just. The word taldot, T-O-L-D-O-T, -O -O it means offspring, generation, and in a general sense, to um, that which generates or reproduces or produces. Alaka, that's H-A-L-A-C-H-A-H, -A -A -H, the way or guide in the day-to-day -day life of a Jew, which in the time of Noah was his conscience, so Noah was being led by a godly conscience. Why did I take my time to point these out? And ha Elohim mean is the name of God. It also represents God's authority. I took the time out to say this because the generation of Noah was one that was pleasing unto God. And so God blessed the, the, the ration that Noah was having and God was increasing Noah and multiplying Noah. Though on the, the ark, it was eight of them that went on. When they came on, there was a multiplying, a great multiplying. So again, Generational curses is when the presence of God is removed. But when the presence of God is pleased and the presence of God is in your life, you must see increase. You must see multiplicity. You must see a an, an, an removal of limitations. There is a reason why God instituted one man to one woman. We already looked at that last week. You know, we, we spoke about the fact that it could be troublesome. 
And I'm being quite honest as a woman. As a woman, we want attention and affection from the one that we say that we love. And so it would be a very contentious thing to put more than one woman in a, in a mix with a man in a house. There is also a reason why the weakening of Samson was a woman. We looked at the fact that, you know, there was one woman he had gone down and seen among the Philistine and he wanted to be married to. And his friend had gone had, after he had stayed for a very long time and took her as wife. And so Samson got mad and burnt down the Philistines' place. And it's a reason why it was Delilah who was the one who got his weakness. Because Samson would have never exposed himself to a man. And so we looked at the fact that this, the reason for this is that genetically, the man is made up to be the seed carrier and the woman responds as the egg. So there is a, a, a reciprocity between the man and the woman. There is an opposite attracting and I, I cannot over emphasize on this because we see that it is an agenda that's being pushed by darkness in this time to try to profane the man and the woman but this is how god has instituted it the fact that the man is a strength and the woman is is the the beauty the woman is the fragility the woman is the softness right so these things they they, they come together a woman looks for security and and safety in the man and the man looks for within the woman conception that woman is supposed to be wise that woman is supposed to make a home that woman makes him feel nurtured and so you have testosterone and you have estrogen again but they, they both work together there is something that combines that that makes it one even though it's two separate things now we looked at the fact that half of a man's lifetime, he seeks to gain a voice. That is what most men do. They identify, they look to identify their image. They want to know who they are. They are led by ambition and they try to establish themselves in hopes of having something that they can call their own. Therefore, when a man gets to a certain age, he wants a wife, not a girlfriend. He wants that woman who he sees as his wife to be the mother of his children. And he wants to possess assets to enable his family to live well. He will then commit himself to knowing who he is and possessing the things he desire. It is such a thing that some men are driven and, and you find that they have an over ambition or they will become over possessive because this is what men are built up and made to do. So you find that some will go in at pursuit of such things, much like, you know, jo Jacob did when he, he, he worked day and night to make sure that the spotted, you know, um, lamb and calves were his. When he was willing to possess Rachel, the one that his heart loved, that he worked an additional seven years after being tricked. So these are the things that a man does. But why does a man do those things? Remember, Adam, which represents man, has within him God's image. He has within him God's voice. He represents the earth. And he is supposed to stand in a place of authority and dominion. So that is why naturally you find a man doing these things. This is the order of God. And might I add that it is very important before a man gets into marriage that he knows who God has called him to be. Know who you are and, and learn to hear God's voice. Because when you do that, then you bring order into the home as a priest. But notice that at the other half of his life, when the man comes into agreement with the woman, they both meet. All of these things that he worked so hard for, it is forgotten as he comes into agreement with the woman because no, it is not just something that he's in training for, but something that becomes a practicality. So now together, the woman that represents the church and the, the, and the man that represents Christ, they come together and they, they start to generate, they start to reproduce. They now start to have authority over other systems and portions of the earth that, that are within their domain, within their authority. And at the end of this, we find now that the woman, she now comes into full conception. She makes her house a home. She makes her family 
feel warmth and nurtured. She comes into an identity now that is not selfish, but selfless. So at the beginning of it, the man needs to learn to commit and submit himself unto God. But when they begin to form life together, they are both coming into commitment with each other, submission unto God. And they are now forming their family to follow the same pattern. The blood of Jesus is not made up of just red and white blood cells as we looked at that's needed to break generational curse. The name of Jesus that we use and the blood of Jesus that we use that we need to break these covenants, these family genetics, these relationship ties, these marriage ties, adoption ties that is carrying generational curses, it carries information inside it. It carries information to the body that helps to make people who they are. You see, this information can then be applied to us through the name of Jesus. So again, the blood of Jesus is tied in with the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the New Testament, the new covenant that is needed that gives us the body of Christ information for how to make the body or the church whole, perfect, blameless, faultless until he comes and glorifies our bodies, literally. This is one of the things that we looked at last week and we want to look at again. First Peter 13, First Peter 1, 13 to 19. It says, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, it goes back to the thoughts. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former loss in your ignorance. And I want to take a pause there and to say, God always deals with the conception of things. Notice he speaks to Adam. And Adam is the, the conception of all seed. He speaks to Eve. Eve is the conceiver for all conception. So lust is where sin begins. God speaks to the lust. Your thought is where the creative things begin. The Lord speaks to the thought. So it is important to notice that God speaks to the art of everything. That is why in order for you to get rid of sin, you don't deal with the lie that you told. You deal with the loss that caused you to tell that lie. You don't deal with the fornication. You deal with the lust within you that caused you to fornicate. You don't deal with the bad behavior. You deal with the thoughts that cause you to behave badly. But let's move on. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And again, I want to establish that conversation is not just the words that comes out of your mouth. But it is the lifestyle that we live. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver or gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, tradition from your fathers, those are generational curses. But with the precious blood of Jesus of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or and without spot, Jesus' blood is perfect. No generational curse. He wasn't born of the seed of a man. He does not carry Adam's DNA. Lord God. And so that is why this blood is the perfect blood to break generational curse and to bring us into that place where we can truly commit in submission. So we're going to go into the study. And these are the scriptures that we'll be looking at. John 1, 23 to 29, Luke 9, 51 to 53, and Luke 13, 35, 33 to 35. But we won't read them just yet. The focus of our study tonight is to examine what it means to commit, 
what it means to submit, who are we called to sub commit in submission to, how does such humility affect our lives? And affect means that there must be a physical change. Effect means it can be an internalized thing, but affect means you need to see it outward as well. How it becomes effective in the lives of others, that's touching them on the innermost part. Why does it, what does it truly mean to commit? What does it mean? See, the word commit is a verb. And we established that a verb is an action word. It means that it, you need to do something. And that verb means to give in charge. So you have to give in the charge of another or to entrust. And we know that we are giving in charge unto God or entrusting unto God. It is from the Latin word committere, which means to unite, to co connect, to combine, to bring together. It is from the word, it is from um, the word come, which means with or together. And it is also from uh, meteor, which means to release, to let go, to send, to throw. And you know what the Lord did, Elder Sharp and Elder Chris, as I was doing, going back over this, the Lord began to show me how that is why when a man and a woman comes together in a covenant called marriage, it is a commitment to each other. And that is why the Lord likens it unto the church. It is commitment because you are coming together. Amen. You are together. You are with each other in agreement. It's not just a physical thing. It's also a spiritual thing. It is a grace of life thing. It's a daily Amen. thing. Amen. Daily you have to agree with each other. Amen. That the mission called marriage is a, that is why marriage is a ministry. It's a purpose because it doesn't just serve you and your wife, Elder Chris. It doesn't just serve you and your wife, Elder Sharp or Elder Marks. It serves you, your wife, your children, grandchildren, great, great grandchildren, all the generations to come. That is why the church of God is the bride of Christ. Because right. when we come together, there should be a mission. There should be something that we are getting ready to agree with each other and combine, con unite, connect together for. That's right. Amen. That is why Jesus right. says right. greater works. What a unique thing. The two become in one flesh. Amen. In the first place, they were in one flesh because the bone was in the body of Adam. Much like the church was in the thoughts and the, the very belly of Jesus. And on the day he was crucified and that water flew out and that blood, it was a purchasing of the church and there was a release. It's the same thing when that rib came out of Adam and went into the other body. Then you saw the two coming together and becoming one. United, connected, combined, working together. So it is with the church and with God. So when you're committing, think of it as this is the closest I believe a person can get with another person. Yes, you, you know, your child, a, a woman's child will be in her womb and will, you know, feed from her as she's feeding. But there's an intimacy between a husband and a wife that no other relationship can touch. And I believe that that's the intimacy the Lord wants to pull us into as we commit to submit to him. There is a, it's more than just a friendship. Such a, 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 an intimate thing that when you, when you think about a husband and a wife, when they, they, they come together, um, make love. And I, I want to mention this because it is very important. There is no separation of the two. The two becomes one. When you are in Christ, nobody should be able to tell you different from God because they, they don't know where you begin. They don't know where Christ ends. That's the kind of intimacy that we are coming into with Christ. There is no separation whatsoever. And when you come into that intimacy, then it begins to touch the life of other persons because it is now a mission. It now has 
purpose. It no, it is a seed that is released, and there is a sending forth. You know, it it, it is much like the, the the teaching that you did, Elder Chris, about the tabernacle. You see, when the five spices came on the altar, and that smoke, rich smoke, began to go up, and the high priest went and put the blood on the mercy seat. Together, there was something that happened. And when that happened, there was a Shekinah that came down. Lord God Almighty, and that Shekinah that came down began to just let there be a smoke, a richness that was evaporating oh, yes, oh, all yes, the oh, place oh, yes. where thousands and millions of people were. And they were all encircled by it. That's what happens. The woman who poured out from her alabaster box. She was in one room. And when she began to pour out that fragrance, the Bible says that it filled all the rooms in the house. There is a fragrance that comes from your commitment and submission unto God that fills every place are associated with. You can be in one location and the very territory that you're in is influenced by it. Because there's a standing for it. There is a releasing there. Mighty God. I don't even know how to really give it the justice. Like the way the Lord put it in my spirit. So when you're committing to God. It's no ordinary thing. And it is something that you are required to do every day. And this then is where the word commission comes for, from. Because it means that you're coming together in combination to send forth an agent for mission. You cannot have a sending forth without some sort of an agent. So it must be a seed. It must be an individual. It must be a word. Something. Something must physically be produced from it that you are sending forth. Just like a husband and a wife as a child. And when they begin to send forth that child into society, that child starts to do and to become. That's what happens when you are committed unto God and you come into this intimacy and you're in commission. There is something that is going forward. And it should benefit the kingdom. Hallelujah. Glory. The Greek word that is translated as commit or committed is epitrophy. And I recognize that I made a, a, a pronunciation mistake last week. So it is epitrophy. It means to give permission to. And by implication, it is saying given full power or commission. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 18. He's getting ready to leave. And he came to them came and spake unto them, saying, All power given unto me in heaven and in earth. Why did he start with that? Because he is now getting ready to commission these ones that have committed unto him. And he's establishing legally what right he is operating under. He's operating under the power that is given unto him in heaven and in earth. Then now we find that this word epitrope, which means to give permission to, given full power and commission to, comes from the word epitripo, which means to turn over all that is to transfer power, authority, to allow, to give liberty to, to let or to permit. So this Jesus, our God, who is getting ready to leave earth in a bodily form, says all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's epitrope. And he's now saying, I am going to give you epitripo. In verse 19 to 20, he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which you know is the name of Jesus Christ, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Why is he with them always after giving them this commission? Because they are committed the who is united. Lord God, the church is the bride of Christ. It is the body of Christ. Christ is in us. We are in Christ. And so he has now taken his epitrope and he has now given us an epitrope. 
allowing us, giving us all this authority that he has in heaven and earth to go and to teach. This is the seed. This is the commission. This is the agent that we are now going to send abroad. The teaching, the baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. So the word commit or committed, it comes also from the word epi with the base show. Now let's look at what epi means. The word epi is a productive prefix. All that means is that you're combining another word or a loan word in Greek with that word. So you have like epicenter, uh, uh, epidemic. You're combining epi, epidemic. You're combining epi with center. So you're, you're combining it with another word to build up a word. What this does then is to create a superimposition. It's that superimposition that epi creates speaks of time, place, and order. And it speaks of time, place, and order as it relates to distribution. Remember, we spoke about ration being the, 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 the distribution, the, the number, the limit. So now, Christ, who is the epi, speaks to the time, the place, and the order, and the distribution thereof. So the superimposition is the act of putting one image on top of another so that the two can be seen combined. That is what Jesus, that is what God did in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, when he blew his breath into the body of man. He said, I will create man in, in his image and in his likeness. And when he was done, he breathed his breath into man. So when you look at man, man became a living soul, but it is the breath of God that is keeping man and making man alive. So it is two. When you looked at Adam, Adam had the image and the likeness of God. So when you looked at him, you saw God. But you could also see that he was man. Because God was not, God is not a, a man. God is a spirit, right? So you look at Adam and you know that Adam is a spirit, a living soul, a spirit being. But he's also a physical being. So there's a superimposition. It is also the act of adding some of the qualities of one system or pattern to another one in order to produce something that combines the qualities of both. And we spoke about all that, you know, an example of that could be Adam and Eve. You know, you took, God took the rib out of Adam to make Eve. And you can distinctly see, you know, two different qualities, but together there is a purpose. You could distinctly look at Adam and earth that he was taken from and see that Adam was superior to the earth, but God is superior to us. So God is the epi, God is the prefix, God is preeminent, God is before, but it's not just any preeminence. He is the productive factor. He's the one that goes before and allows us to produce. And then you look at the base of the word trope or trope. It means a turn that is a revolution, figuratively, variation or turning. So in other words, when God created Adam, Adam should have been the revolution that would have been causing all man on earth to know who their God is and to act in dominion and power and replenish and multiply. But look at what happened. The base word trope also has variation in it. And that variation is a change or difference in condition, amount, or level, typically with certain limits. How did this come in? Because God made Adam perfect, blameless, and so was the genes of man to be, so that we could commit in submission. But what happened was Adam gave ear to the enemy. And so when generational curses come in because we give room to the enemy, it creates a difference in condition, in amount, in level, in the limits that we have. We are not, not no, operating limitlessly, but we are operated limited because a variation has come in. It is also a different or distinct form or version of something. So Adam initially, was operating in the epi with God. 
But when you, you allow certain curses, certain sins to come in, then there is a, a distinct version of what you, are, you ought to have been in the beginning. This is what now we see causing generational curses. This is what we see now causing mankind not to be able to commit and to submit the way that they want to because there are things that have gotten in that should not have gotten in. And I want to take a pause and to say to somebody, whatever may be happening in your life right now, after you're examining it, and you feel like you're not operating at the level that you used to before, ask the Lord to show you plainly so that you can pray against that, apply his name and blood, and physically walk out of it so that you can go back to operating in a place where your faith is not limited in God anymore. And as I'm saying this to you, I'm saying it to me because I'm taking mental note so I can go and do these things myself. But moving on. Adam was the image and likeness of God. God was the epi, the prefix, the productive factor that preceded everything, the superimposition that resulted in Adam being a living soul and the physical expression of God's breath in man. The earth was pure and innocent. And what it did was to reflect man's soul, man's thoughts, because man was from it. The systems thereof were subjected to the order, the principles, the times and seasons of God. And it was according to how God declared it. It was a pattern and the will of God and earth as it is in heaven. So earth was reflecting what was happening in heaven. God's will being carried out, God's uh, declarations and, and, and statutes being followed, instructions being followed. This was how beautiful it was. The Garden of Eden had certain features that was like the throne of God in the, in the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Genesis 2 and verse 9, and I cannot get tired of reading this because it, it just makes me feel so good to know what it shall be in heaven. It says in verse nine, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Listen to Revelation 22 and verse two. This is what we shall be um, getting when we get to heaven. It says, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we know that in the middle of the garden was a tree of life, and it is so in the midst of the, the, the throne of heaven is the tree of life. There is a river that flows from the garden, and that is according to verse 10 in chapter 2. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Revelation 22, 1 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. Lord Jesus, Jesus is. So when he was speaking to the woman at the well, the woman at the well couldn't understand. She couldn't fathom it. Just how deep Jesus was going when he says that if you drink of the water that I shall give you, you will never thirst again. Lord Jesus, my God. For he is the fountain of living water. It is out of him, Lord Jesus, that the nations and the worlds will be fed. They will never thirst again. But let us move on. When Adam fell, then a variation happened. A different type of condition, limit, and level was applied. He had none before, but when he fell, he had. That's what happens when there is a generational curse in our lives. 
a legality was given to the devil on earth that was and still is not is. He robbed, he schemed, he tricked, he connived, he deceived to get that legality. And it's still not is. And to this day, it keeps increasing in some people's life because instead of trying to turn away and to gain back their dominion through the blood and name of Jesus, there are some of us that will go very deep. So until God came in the person of Jesus Christ and redeemed, remitted, circumcised, reconciled, and literally died in our place to restore our DNA and our commission, this was the reality that we were limited, we were conditioned. That is why there was a veil in the tabernacle. Man could not see God's glory. Man was not invited in. No, the invitation is to all. Jesus changed our names when he came and shed his blood. He changed our genetic deficiencies spiritually. See, Adam, what Adam did was physical. But what Jesus did is spiritual. Because remember, again, it is from the thoughts of a man that our behaviors are influenced and our language comes forth. It is from the lust within our spirit that sin is conceived. Look at it, the seed and the conceiver. The seed is the thought. The conception is the lust. So when the thought and the lust comes together, that is what drew Eve away and caused her to eat and to present it as something that was good to Adam and he was enticed. It is the thought. The seed is the thought and the lust is the conceiver together when those go together. Lord God help us. Amen. When lust is conceived, it brings forth. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so Jesus now, with his new will and testament, signed with his blood and his name, which is now our DNA, then th this then leaves us with the hope for a glorified body because guess what? We are now in a place we, where we are regenerated so our thoughts now wants to come back into obedience unto God. And because our, our thoughts are being put under subjection and submission unto God and we are now going back into obedience, we are now doing what is called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy to the body. We are saying to our bodies that you cannot do these things and sin against God. And it is the word of God, the blood of God, the name of God that is empowering us, the spirit of God, to be able to do these things. Because again, he is changing our genetic deficiencies, the things that was within us spiritually that was causing us to rebel and to not come under submission and subjection unto him. It is now cut out. It is circumcised. It is dissected. And God Almighty has used his, his name to create a synthesis within us that is now, has now sealed that gap. So just to read the word, to remember the word, and to apply the word. We are now left in a hope that one day we are going to be caught up with him and have glorified body. This corruption is going to put on incorruption. This mortal is going to put on immortality. Remember, that was the state that Adam was in. Adam was an immortal man that had access to heaven and earth. Today, the name, the blood of Jesus has given us access to sit together with him in heavenly places, but our bodies are not yet glorified. But until we get glorified bodies, we are commissioned to remain holy, righteous, and true. That is what God is calling us into as we commit and we submit. So a new commission is issued. And remember what the commission is. The commission is coming from you being connected and united together with God. And out of that intimacy, a mission is being formed with an agent. So that agent can no longer be just to abstain and to be innocent. It cannot only be your conscience. It cannot not only be an observance of human government. It cannot only be a promise. It cannot not only be the law. It cannot only be circumcision. But what it is now is an abundance of God's grace that ends 
encompasses those who permit him to reconstruct, regenerate them. Oh, that's all because you need your genes fixed so that you will not have a rate or a limitation where the operation is concerned. He cannot send you out as his age without a briefing and a physical fitness. And all of this has to start with you coming into that grace that is abundant, observing all the things that he has mandated you to in his word and permitting him to reconstruct you, regenerate you daily. And that briefing comes through his word. Remember we spoke about um, soldiers. When they're going out into battle, soldiers are always briefed. And different uh, ranks are briefed at different levels. See what the general will get and the majors, the lieutenants and the corporals, the private will not get it. And so as you move from level to level to level in the Lord, you have to go through briefing and you go through a physical fitness and you know that the physical fitness is not just to build muscles and be in a good condition bodily as soldiers are required to be, but we need to go through the furnace of affliction, learn to dance in your home where you are being persecuted, within your churches where you're coming through judgments. And I'm talking about within the body of Christ, not just a physical location because the judgment starts within the body of Christ first. So you are daily going through some sort of judgment or the other. You are going through some affliction, some intense heat is what you're coming under. And all of that is physical fitness. See, when a Marine, when a, when a Marine is going into training, they give them a backpack. And I think it's supposed to weigh something between 30 to 55 pounds, right? They get a meal ready to eat, MRE, and they are given a 55 hour training where they are not supposed to respond to the physical cry of their body. So if they want to poop or to pee and stuff like that, they have to condition their body and to understand that this is physical training for what they will do when they will go out there to represent their country. Seals are thrown into tanks if they don't know how to swim. And they have to learn that way. Why? Because they are conditioning them. There are certain things that they go through as they are at different ranks. Because if you are caught and you're going under waterboarding, you should know what it means to endure first before you go out there. And so that is the thing that the Lord does with us when we are coming into this commission, as we are committed with him, as we are in submission with him, as we are going into intimacy with him. It is the intense a fire and affliction. And, and struggles that we go on to that makes us depend upon him more. And the more we depend upon him, it's the more intertwined, the more connected, the more united we become with him. And the more that happens, it's the more that he breaks down his word and starts to, to just reveal himself to you. I want to give two examples. I want to give Elijah. Remember when Elijah brought down the altars of Baal and destroyed the false prophets? His life was in danger and he ran and he wanted to die. He was in such despair and anger. Angry with Israel. He was angry with Jezebel. He was angry with Ahab. He was angry with himself. And at the same time, he felt like he had let down God and the mission he was sent on. And so he wanted to die. But when he came into contact with God, look at what God did. God spoke to him in a still small voice after appeasing what he was seeking for. Okay, you're asking for these things. That's what you're expecting. I'll show you these things, Elijah. And God ripped the mountain. And I believe that fear would have shook him because the Bible says that there were rocks that fell off. There was fire. There was earthquake. There was wind. And God was not in any of those. But when God came in the still small voice, it was even louder than the earth, the wind, the earthquake, the earthquake and the fire because Elijah covered his face with his mantle. And when that happened, then Elijah got to a place where fear would never drive him again to suicide. Lord God Almighty. Elijah became so fierce that when armies came for me, he said, all right, if I'm the man of God, let fire come and destroy you. 
And the second example I want to use is myself. Last year, when my grandmother died and I was in utter despair, and I mean utter, utter despair, all I could do was cry. And I remember in one of those sessions, the Lord brought me to Hebrews chapter 12. And he started to say, you are a son. And that is why you are being chastened. If you were a bastard, I wouldn't chasten you. And he began to take me through Isaiah. And he began to tie the scriptures together and to show me what it means to be a son because it is through the sonship of Jesus Christ that I am a son, Lord God. And then he brought me into Psalms 22 and he said, daughter, look, when I was on the cross, I wasn't saying Eli, Eli is the back because I was crying out of my weakness, but it was purpose because I was pointing Israel to me. Lord Jesus, Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and far from the words of my roaring? It continues to talk about them parting his garments and stuff. So for those Pharisees who should have already known and the Sadducees, the same one who were his persecutors, he was extending love and saying, look, these things that I'm doing, they're written in the word. So when you're going through your affliction and you come into Christ, it carries purpose. Remember again, it is the combination. It is the commitment. It is the come and the mission. It is the come and the mit. You join together for something. So I want to say to you that when you're going through your briefing, when you're going through your physical fitness, it is not something that you're going through to just say, I have gone through hardships. It benefits the kingdom of God and it pulls you into a greater anointing. Because can I tell you that what came out of that altar was that my altar got hotter, literally hotter. My prayer became sweeter and the Lord brought me into something that when I experienced it, I said, God, I would go over everything again just to experience this. This was the sweetest thing I have ever experienced. And I want to get again to allude to husband and wife in the situation because there's some husband and wife when, you know, you have a falling out. You feel like, man, nothing, it, it, you're never going to come together in agreement again. And it's like the world is on your shoulder. But when you come to agreement, it's the sweetest thing. Lord God, it's like it never happened. And you learn to grow from there. So when other things come, you don't react to it that way anymore. Because you would have learned from that. That's what the briefing and the physical fitness in Christ does. When you come into commitment to submit to him. You're beginning to learn. Remember Peter when he denied Christ? And when Jesus was, you know, reconciling him, he was getting angry and he was questioning things. But after a while, this is what Peter says I rejoice in my infirmity. Peter is the same one that says to us that we are to suffer with him in order to reign with him because he now got it. He was now in the commission of Christ. Let's move on. All of us are called into the mission of reproduction and replenishing the earth. We are called to take care of our homes, our families, our environment. We are called to be God's image and likeness by being salt and light. And again, I want to let you know that salt is not just for the preservation. Yes, we are to preserve on this earth, but we are also to fellowship. We are supposed to let others feel the love and the grace of God because we are God's extension on earth. We are his representatives. We are his diplomats sent forth. And what does God represent? God represents love and light. God represents healing. God represents deliverance. God represents reproduction. God represents a regeneration. God represents life. We are all commissioned, called into the mission of being holy as he is holy. 
We are called to be witnesses legally. We are to represent Jesus. So when hell comes to strike an argument, heaven is supposed to say, no, nah, dismiss. We are called into the mission to have dominion over the works of God's hand on earth. You know what that means? That means that Elder Marks, if you have a plot of land that you want to build up, you want to get some vegetation from it, you can go out there and command that earth to be reproductive in the name of Jesus. You see, when you get your fowl and you get your goat and you get your cow and you get all the other um, plants and trees that you want, you can now begin to speak to them and say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to multiply because you have authority over the earth, over the creative things of God and the systems thereof. That is why Joshua could look at the sun and say, sun, be still, because it served the purpose of fighting off the, the enemies of the kingdom of God. We are called into the mission of love. We are called to take care of the poor, the widowed and the orphans. And you know, before I move on to, I want to say where dominion is concerned. That is why I take prior walks in my community. I walk over the community and I tell the districts and the different areas that persons are loose now, they are healed now, they will be saved now, they will know the truth now. I do that because I understand that I have dominion over this land and wherever I set my feet, I am representing Christ and I am the voice of God. But let's move on. We are called into the mission of caring for the poor, the widowed and the orphan. Stop walking away from people, even when you cannot prove if they really need it. We are supposed to give to all men. That's God's commission to us. To bless our enemies and pray for those who use us. And the Bible says despitefully use us. That means they are being spiteful and they're going out of their way to really hurt us. But we are to bless them. You know why? Because when you do that, you heap coals of fire on their head. And <laughs> as a young Christian, Elder Sharp, I thought that meant that they would be burned, man. Man of vengeance are going to be taken over them. But that's not what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying when they look and see that they don't deserve the kindness and the love that you are giving unto them, it breaks them and causes them to be in a place of torment mentally Amen. until change happens. Amen. So you have the ability to force people to change by your actions, not even your words, like your actions. Hallelujah. Amen. That is why we are called to commit in submission because it is a doing. Remember, commission to commit, it's a verb, it's an acting, it's an action, something. And it's you're not putting on a show neither. You're doing it because you're truly in union with God. You're in intimacy with God. You're together. With, so God's heart is your heart. God's heartbeat is your heartbeat. When you dance with somebody, you should be moving at the same beat. So if it's a four or, or eight or whatever, you are moving at the same pace. You're not outpacing each other. If God's heart is going goo 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 goo, yours is going goo 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 goo. You're not going goo 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 goo. While God is going goo 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 goo, it's this heaven and you are on the same pace. That is why the kingdom of God will precede us because guess what? We are on God's mission. So God have to honor the seed that we are sending forth because it's a kingdom thing and not a self thing. It serves a purpose. Remember, we spoke about that. You're coming together for that mission to serve a purpose so that agent must go out. Lord God. In committing to God, this is a view that is first evident to the naked eye. You are like a lump of clay in the potters, and this is how all of us come. Messy, gooey, gooey. We don't have no structure. We don't have no order because our whole season and time and order, it has been messed up. Generational curses caused it to be messed up. So the Lord now puts us in his loving hands and begin to mold us. And when he begins to mold us, because we have committed ourselves to come in agreement with him, 
then it sets us free from generational curses and allows us to submit because we are no longer trying to resist or rebel or laying blame on anyone. But we are taking accountability and trusting God at his words. It is giving yourself into God's hand for a turn or change that will birth or produce a purpose that is greater than yourself. I cannot overstress that it must be greater than us. Because again, God does not do anything that is one dimensional. It is always multidimensional and it is on a grand scale. Commitment must Lead the one that is now free from generational curses to submit to God, a reiteration. Because I'm trying to make emphasis. What does it mean to submit? And um, I'm going to take a pause here to say, Elder Sharp, please give me a nudge um, when the time comes because I wasn't taking note. So when it is time to end, please give me a nudge, please. Elder Chris will do that. All right, thank you, Elder Chris. What does it mean to submit? Because in submission, you're going to come against two wills. There's your will and there's God's will. Two. And the enemy seeks, the enemy oftentimes feed into your will. So there's always a manipulation where your will is concerned. So what does it mean to submit? First, let's look at some words that would come to one's mind or may come to one's mind when you think about sub submitting. You think about subject, subdue, under, humble, prostrate, subordinate, obey, or abase. And all these words are fine because it does do justice to submit. But let's look at submit a little bit deeper. The word submit is a verb, again, another action, which means you are placing yourself under the control of another to yield yourself. You are placing yourself, you are taking the control, the power, the authority that you have, and you are putting yourself under the control of another, and it's not just any other, but God, to yield yourself to his will. That means you are stopping to his will and whatever his word is, that's what you will do. Remember to yield is not the same as surrender. When you're surrendering, you are flying a flag and you may be moving still, but all you're saying is that I, will, I, I, I promise not to use my resources. You're not promising not to, to still retain your control. You're promising not to use your resources. But when you yield, you stop. And you say, I have no more power. My power is rescinded and I fall under subjection to your power. So whatever you say is what it's going to be. I am under your control. And we know what the word uh, mitir means, to let go and to send. But look at what sub means. Sub means to yield, to lower, to let down to put under and to reduce. That is why we prostrate ourselves before God because we are lowering ourselves, we are letting down, recognizing that he is sovereign and I. We are putting ourselves under his control and we are stopping. But the word reduce, that is why John says, I must decrease, but he must increase. Understanding that before Jesus came on the scene, there's one Literature that says that John would baptize thousands of people on one day. But when Jesus came, people weren't really listening to John anymore. Because a greater than John is there. So you have to understand that you are now putting everything that would have dis described you, defined you under the control of God. And you're saying, God, let your reputation precede mine. God, let your character precede mine. God, let your integrity precede mine. So this is what it means now to submit. The mission will not lo no longer be my mission, but I am under your mission. I stop to allow your vision, your will to proceed. And this is where the word submission comes from. You see, a submarine, it goes under water and it goes forward. But the mission that it is going on, 
is for the country and it is led by a general or some person of high rank. So it is with us. When we put on the name of Jesus and we have the Holy Ghost, we are putting ourselves under God's control to be directed by the Spirit of the Lord for the purpose of the kingdom of God. That is what no true submission is. I thank you, Jesus. The Greek word for submit is upatasso. It means to subordinate, to obey, to be under obedience, to put under, to subdue unto, to be made subjected unto. And I want to continue with that submarine because you know what? The submarine cannot say to the controller that I want to turn this way or that way. Cannot. It has to go by a single oar wherever the controller is turning it. You see this, this lump of clay? This is how we begin when we come to the Lord. A, a lump, no form. Submitting ourselves, committing to submit. We have now put ourselves under God's hand unto obedience. And when God starts to spin us on the pottery wheel, there is a little bit of formation that is coming. But guess what? It's a painful process. And a dirty process too, because he has to keep wetting his hand. And there's a lot of muck and there's a lot of, of flaws and there's a lot of sediments and stuff that he has to be pressing to get out of us. And it's always from the inside out. Again, the thoughts and the very loss on the inside, Lord God. That is why God desires truth and the inward part. Listen to what James 4 and verse 7 says. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And who are we to resist? The devil, and he will flee from us. So when certain thoughts come to you, don't make provision for the flesh. Resist it, but submit to God. See, so when you're there on the potter's wheel and everything is saying to your man, this season, you know, I forgot you. You don't have to stay here and take this from these people. Leave here. Sub subordinate yourself, subdue yourself, subject yourself to God. And if God don't tell you to leave, don't leave. Stay right there until he's done forming you because eventually you're going to take some sort of a form until you're going to become a definite piece of pottery. And I want to say this, that when the Lord is done forming you, the use is still never for yourself because a piece of pottery cannot use itself. A cup cannot drink from itself. A plate cannot eat from itself. It doesn't have the ability to do that. A tree that is planted, the fruits on the tree is not for the tree. And so if no one comes to pick it, the fruits fall off and it rots. And then those seeds go down into the ground, germinate, and the process starts all over again. So understand that when you submit yourself to God in commitment, the use and the purpose of your life is for the kingdom and for another. It's always a selfless thing. And the thing is shown in a family. Notice when a baby is born to a husband and a wife. It's a little creature, but it makes much demands. You have sleepless nights. And on top of your sleepless nights, you have to work tirelessly. You have to work to gain financial uh, uh, ability so you can take care of that child. You have to work to take care of the child's need throughout the, the entirety of the day. And you do so selflessly because of the love and the commitment that you have to your family. So it is when we commit ourselves and submit ourselves to God. Are doing so in a loving manner, understanding that there is a greater purpose for others that we too must love and must touch. Moving on. Who are you called to commit in submission to? We are called to submit to God, to our spouse, to our leaders and masters to every ordinance of, God, of man for the sake of God, to the laws of the land, to one another, children, to parents. And notice it starts with God. 
John 1, 23 to 29 says this. Elder Chris, feel free to unmute and let me know because I cannot see in the chat, so I will not be able to respond if you're texting me there. John 1, 23 to 29 says this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, and that is close to the wilderness where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John was a regenerated seed that was released with the commission to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But he was a product of a couple that was committed to their submission to God. For see, Elizabeth and Zacharias, the Lord commended them of their work that they were blameless and perfect before him. That was God commending them. And so Luke had to write about it because everyone found favor with them. But look at this. This couple was without child and yet they were stricken in age. And so at an appropriate time, verse eight says, and it came to pass in Luke chapter one, that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, now the word that, that stands as there and it came to pass, it indicates that a change is about to take place. Anytime in the scriptures you see it says, and it came to pass, it means the scene is going to change. It means the season is getting ready to change. And it means that something is turning. So here it is that these people are committed to doing what God has called them to do. They are committed to their submission unto God and they're doing it perfectly, but they're in an old age and don't have a child. And the angel of the living God comes to Zechariah in the temple where he's doing his work and says to him, your prior is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John. Remember, Elizabeth was barren. Something had happened to close her womb along the way. And it wanted to be a generational thing because it would have shut down the genes of, of, of Zachariah. It would never have been listed anymore. Because if you don't have a child, you're not listed anymore. So within the, the clerical books in the temple, Zachariah's name would have stopped right there as the son of his father. And it, it would have ended there. It probably would have bore record of the fact that he was a priest married to Elizabeth, but nothing else. But God said, no, it's not going to be like that. And so in verse 13, look at what God does. God allowed the legal system of heaven to come and rip apart the legal system of earth and every other realm that was manipulating the reproduction of Zachariah. And Gabriel, who is the administration of prayer, because we see him in verse 19 of chapter 1, telling who he is. In Daniel 8, 15 to 19, answering prayers, Daniel 9, 20 to 22, and Luke 1, 26, appearing unto Mary. He is the man that comes with the answers for prayer. So it tells me that he is chief in charge of prayers. So when answers for prayer is released, he has to move immediately. And this one comes immediately with the message and instructions. But look at what he does. When he comes, he speaks to Zacharias, yes, but he's also speaking to the seed in Zacharias, which is who John is. John was a seed in his father. And, and the angel begins to tell that, listen, thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. 
So listen, Zacharias, this is what is going to happen. Your wife is going to, going to conceive. You're going to have joy and gladness. Many other are going to rejoice as his birth. And then he begins to download and deposit in the seed. He says, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. So already the seed is receiving that word that, listen, you will not like wine nor strong drink. The very look of it, the very smell of it is going to turn your stomach because it will never come to your mouth. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. So when Mary gave that salutation and the baby was leaping, that's because he had the Holy Ghost. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him, him the Lord God Almighty, in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people appeared for the lord that is why in luke john chapter 1 23 to 29 that we read john was right there by bethabara beyond jordan preaching and baptizing because that was his commission the word was sent forth out of the mouth of gabriel already and because he, he is regenerated there is no limitation there is no uh, a boundary is to always going to operate. And that is why this man could do this ministry this way. But I want you to understand that when you commit to God and you're in submission to God, whatever he releases as a seed unto you, it is also your reward. See, the word committed or commit in Hebrew is nathan. It means to give to use the greatest latitude of application. Now that, that little phrase there, greatest latitude of app application, means to have freedom in action, thought and behavior, to bestow or charge. And that is why John operated the way that he did. Nobody could put a, 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 a cap on him. He looked at the Pharisees and he was not intimidated. He said, oh, generation of vipers who have warned you to escape the wrath that is to come. He was not afraid of the kings and the queens of his time. He looked at Herod and he said, you are in error because you are sleeping and you have killed your brother for his wife. And this goes directly against the Torah and its laws. I wonder how many of us in our commitment in being submitted to God will be bold enough to face individuals and be able to say to them that this is not of God. But do it in such a way that it is the Holy Spirit that's leading you and you're not just having a righteous indignation. Because, you know, this was one thing I was saying to Evangelist Coda last night, I think, or the night before. Notice of the Lord. No, it wasn't Evangelist Coda. It was another person. I'm sorry. I was saying notice how the Lord operates. John's duty was to come and restore the children to their father. Yet he spoke with an aggressive and hostile tone. Or with the intent to have them to look within themselves and see where they are spiritually. Jesus intent, Jesus mission, he said, he said when he comes, he's going to, there's going to be separation in the home because guess what? The, the sins of man is going to be revealed. The light will shine and the darkness cannot see it. Yet Jesus spoke so gently. So I want people to understand this. Don't look at people's tone. Look at what the word of the Lord is coming to you about. Because sometimes the motive that the Holy Ghost is using somebody to speak to you who is committed to working the will of God may not be what you will necessarily like or even look for. Look at Elijah. Elijah was looking for the experience that Moses had. And God was saying to him, you're not going to experience that because that's not for you. You are going to get the still small voice. But let us continue. The words that spell Nathan are Nun, N, Tav, T-H, and Nun. The picture graph of Nun looks like a seed, whereas a classical Hebrew script is constructed as a bent uh, bav, like you're seeing right here at the end, with a crown, like a zayin. Zayin is, a, is the letter Z in Hebrew. 
Nun represents faithfulness and the reward of the faithful. This is what I mean that when you commit yourself in submission, the seed that is your reward for your faithfulness is also the seed that is a crown upon your head. Zayin is a letter Z in Hebrew, and it means weapon, sword, food, sustenance. It also represents an agricultural tool such as a hoe used to plow the ground. That is why John operated the way he did. He was making ready the hearts of men with the message of repentance and baptism for the word of the kingdom that God was carrying. He operated as a weapon and a sword that was breaking up the fallow ground of man's heart. He was a prophet in a time when there was silence in Israel. And so he was feeding them again with spiritual food. John was a two-edged sword that prepared the way of the Lord. His message of repentance and of baptism was necessary to pull the ground for men to be ready for the word of God. You see, the picture graph of the word tab, the letter tab, looks like a seal or a stamp. And it is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet and represents humility. That is why Jesus is the first and the last. He's preeminent, but yet he's lowly. It means code, note, stamp, or impression. So the stamp of God is truth. When that impression gets into your spirit, when that stamp or code gets into you, my God Almighty, it gives you a, a, a re- generation it gives you new information it gives you new instructions that is all true the tab represents truth and that is why when you come to commit and to submit it requires the spirit of truth you cannot do it if you don't have the holy ghost there is no commitment without the holy ghost because it is the Holy Ghost that's going to guide us. God is the spirit of truth and if you have the Holy Ghost and not reading the word there is no truth submission or commission because you cannot commit if you don't know what you're required to commit to and so the tab represents truth false submission would be somebody who makes declaration in word and deed but they're not humble they're not subject or obedient False submission does not honor God because it is not good. It is not true or for good moral report. It is therefore tainted, corrupted, evil, and dark. And it carries consequences that will result in death. A false submission can be done by somebody that don't have the Holy Ghost, is not baptized in the name of Jesus. But it can also be done by those that are, are, are also Filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in the name of Jesus because you're not walking in obedience. You're not truly subjected unto God. God's mission is not yours. You're not putting yourself under God's influence and you're not yielding to him. So that's a false submission and that's a lie. But when you commit to submit to God, the indelible mark of God must be and impressed in your very being. Your mind, your body, and soul through repentance first, water baptism, in filling of the Holy Ghost, and obedience. People of the living God, I want to stress this because oftentimes we think that we can just pray and shake and get away with doing things. We need to be obedient to God. When, when, when Samson was disobedient, he tried to shake himself as at other times and nothing happened. Disobedience is the very sin that caused man to fall in the very beginning. Obedience. This is why the word says obedience is better than sacrifice. Because if Adam and Eve obeyed, they would not have needed to sacrifice. It's better. It's a proactive work. Had they been proactive, they would not have needed to be reactive with sacrifice. John had the spirit of God with him, and he was also driven by the mission God sent him for to accomplish. He was not wondering what his purpose was. He believed the word of God, released over his life, and walked accordingly. That is why he was at Bethabara. 
That is why I preach a message of repentance and to baptism. To be committed is to dissolve your will and authority, trusting in the mission of God. To be committed is to be consistent, persistent, doing with regularity. Commit in submission is to act. You must do. Something is expected of us. Luke 9, 51 to 53 says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus was committed to going into Jerusalem because he knew he had to die there. But his disciples went to Samaria, the villages of Samaria. And guess what? No one had preparation there because that was not the mission. The mission was for the seed. Jesus Christ, the, the Shiloh, the Lamb of God to be in Jerusalem. You see, when you're committed to the mission, you are determined to go one way. And that way is in the direction that the Holy Ghost is pointing you because you have submitted and yielded unto the will of God. And so provision will be made in that direction. Do not go anywhere else. Anywhere else you go, no provision will be there. And you will find it hard to operate because that's not where the Lord is directing you. If the Lord said to you, go to Montego Bay, go by the, the, the clock, turn right, and three stars down, you'll see a woman in white. Why do you want to go left when you get to the clock and go three stars or five stars down? He knows what he's doing. God is all knowing. As a son of God, in order to, com to be committed, it requires you to be cognitive of the word and will of God. So it's not just prayer alone. It's not just reading the word. But you need to listen for him. Remember, in submitting, you must yield. You must stop. It is allowing his work. It requires freedom to act, to speak, to behave on the behalf of God. But in order for you to do that, you have to let his work be completed in you. Adam could not name the animals if he had not listened to the instructions of God, received the breath of God, and spoke with God. It must leave an impression on your soul that moves you into action. So first, the impact must be on you. You see that stamp, that impression, Lord God, if you're not impressed, how can you impress another person? It's like some salesman coming with their, 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 their script. They're really not passionate. They're really not impressed. And they're really not going to get any consumers. But if you're really impressed, if that impression is on your soul, then it's going to propel you into action. It must propel you into not just any movement, but as God speaks, it is always according to God's will. And your mission must become your lifestyle. It is now your identity. It forms your character and it gives you integrity. So there's no you without God and his mission and his will. And that is why it requires the word of God, the will of God, and the spirit of God. Luke 13, 33 to 35 says, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee? How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Just that verse alone would have told them that this is indeed the Messiah. This is God. He continues. He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And it would have been when I would have been gone. My God, they would have missed missed the mark because they were not 
submitted in their commission. Jesus who was submitted knows that Jerusalem is where he needs to be. God's will versus your will. In concluding, the seed you sow in commitment to God is yourself. It is a painful journey because it is not done ignorantly. But when your will completely dies and God's will precede you, when you come in agreement with him, there is strength and ability. Remember when Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And an angel from heaven strengthened him. His will broke and his DNA released self-will. I'm going to stop there for tonight. And I want to thank you all for staying and listening. There is more to it on um, Facebook. I don't want to go too long because we're already in, at 9.30. But I pray that you will go back and revisit the rest in concluding. And, you know, make notes because indeed the Lord did add more stuff tonight. And I give him thanks. I bless him and I praise him. I pray that we will commit and submit ourselves to God selflessly. Don't look about no accolade. You know, one of the things that Jesus did, he fashioned himself like a man and made himself of no reputation. That's one of the greatest downfall of man when we want a reputation, when we want to be the next big thing. That's what the enemy used to deceive Eve and Adam. Let it not be what pulls us away into that generational curse, but let us propel forward and serve God in spirit and in truth. God bless you. And over to you, um, Elder Chris, in the name of Jesus. Let's praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. If you can open your mics at this time and just worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This tonight has been glory to God. My icing on the top. You. We give you thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, we glorify and praise you, Lord. We give you thanks. Jesus. For this word tonight, Hallelujah, Jesus, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Jesus, your word, the Lord, your word, the Lord, your word, the Lord, magnify you. Thank you, your word, your goodness and your mercies to us. Thank you, your word, the Lord. I'm committed to submitting to you. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. I really can't think of a most appropriate way Jesus. to thank you. To bring uh, the studies for this year to an end than this icing that has been placed on top. Again, the challenge and the clarion call is is, is ringing in my ears. I need for submission. I think God's willing comes in the coming the new year that our entire approach to the matter of the kingdom will be different. Hallelujah. I'm believing that God is going to do mighty things through his people. Amen. Starting with us that have been on this broadcast and have participated and received this comprehensive teaching for the past three, four weeks. I know God is going to, his word will not return to him, boy, but it will accomplish purpose to which it is, has been sent. And so we just want to, again tonight, really bless Evangelist Kerry and give God thanks for the commitment that she has mm -hmm made to, to this ministry and to ministering the word in such a comprehensive and powerful way. I don't, 
Listen, I don't even have enough words to express how the gratitude I have for this tonight. I am truly challenged. Uh, she's there teaching and I am just flipping through scriptures. I mean, I'm just going through other scriptures on my, my, my device here, you know. It's, it's really because it's driving me into, into the word even deeper. I don't know how everybody else is feeling, but I, I am I am challenged. I am challenged to 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 dive deeper and to submit um even more so to the will of Almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Vangelis Kerian. Oh my God, the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give his peace and continue to enlighten you, inspire you and to use you mightily. He is going to take your places, my dear. Amen. You just keep, keep humble before him as you have always done. And watch God just move mightily through you. I, I like the way you partner with Evangelist Nicoda. You know, she's your, your prayer mother. Uh, to, I, I'm seeing that she's your prayer mother, you know, and, and that is such, so, so, so good. You need to have that kind of a prayer partner, you know, to, to help to enhance your ministry. I just want to thank everyone that has taken the time to be a part of this study it is on facebook i want to thank those that have joined in on facebook and um and for those who want to revisit these lessons they're available you can always go on facebook and um you can peruse go through them over and over again amen um i don't know if uh Elder Sharp or Elder Hill or anybody else wants to make any brief comments at this time before we uh, close in prayer. Anybody else um, want to make any comments at this time? Brief comments before we close in prayer. The mics are now open for you to do so. Just, just, just remind the Father Brother to pray for the Willis family. Could you repeat that? Just remind the brethren, or when we're closing tonight, to pray for the Willis family, Pastor. Oh, yes, most definitely. Thank, thanks for that reminder. All right. Um, any, any other comments anybody want to make at this time? All right. Um, we're going to allow that after we pray then. Um, as Ella Sharp just mentioned, a reminder, um, we are requesting prayer for the Willis family um, who have just lost their father, their hus husband, father, uncle, brother, friend, and pastor. That's Pastor Wilfred Willis um, passed suddenly yesterday um, while in service. So. We, we ask that you remember this family in prayer tonight as we close. Amen. And of course, we want to have that special prayer over Evangelist Mitchell that the Lord will surround her, cover her, empower, undergird her. Amen. All right. Can I invite you all at this time to join me in prayer? Mighty God, again, we want to give you thanks for who you are we thank you for your presence that is not limited by technology not limited by time not limited by the airwaves nor by fiber optics nor copper wire dear god oh god before all these things were invented you knew them dear god from you all wisdom and knowledge comes dear god so we know you're not limited by these things, Lord. We felt your presence even as we listened to your words being taught tonight, dear God. We felt your awesome presence at work. Mm -hmm. So, dear God, we want to give you thanks for your word. We thank you for the inspiration 
the fresh anointing that you have poured in us, your God, and the challenge that you have given us, Lord, to submit ourselves to you more and to, to go deeper in our relationship with you. We thank you for your servant, dear God, who have availed herself, your Lord, and committed herself to prayer, oh God, and to read and reading and studying of your word so that she can be used in this way, dear God, we ask you, Lord, to replenish her vessel, dear God, how even as she has poured out, Lord, pour back into her, dear God, from her head right down to her feet, anoint her afresh with the power from on high. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, surround her, Lord, and undergird her. Your power divine, dear God. No weapon that is formed against her will prosper because she is called Ashaya. Hallelujah. And chosen by your Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So I ask you right now, dear God, to continue to be our provider, our keeper, her strong power. Oh God, our very present help in time of trouble. Dear God, continue to use her mightily. We thank you for everyone that has joined on this program tonight, dear God. Some just got in from work. Some not even eat as yet, dear God, but Lord, they just could not miss out on the word tonight, dear God. Lord, let a special blessing be upon everyone that came on tonight, those that are on Facebook, those that are on this Zoom platform, and even those that will be viewing the recordings over time, dear God, let there be a blessing, even as they do so. Father, we place before you. Lord, the family, the Willis family at this time, dear God. You see the grief and the pain and the hurt, hallelujah, that they're going through. Not just the immediate family of our brother that has suddenly passed, dear God, but the church yes. family and the whole oneness apostolic, Lord. I ask you right now, dear God, that your, your, your comfort and your peace Hallelujah, will be imparted to the families, dear God. Lord Jesus, peace that passeth all understanding. Lord mm -hmm. God, we know that there is no sorrow on earth that heaven, but, hallelujah, cannot answer. Jesus, hallelujah, come to the rescue of your people, Lord. Hallelujah, yes, hear your cry attend to their prayers, dear God. Yes. Lord Jesus, Lord, sons have lost their fathers, nephews and nieces have lost their uncle, dear God, a wife has lost her husband, a church has lost their pastor. But oh God, you said you're a very present help in time. Oh, of trouble. oh God, you say when mother and father forsake us, you will pick us up, you take us up, Lord. Even so, dear God, we ask you to succor them, dear God, and to, to keep them, hallelujah. Wrap your arms around them, embrace them, dear God, and let them feel the comfort that only you can bring. Hallelujah, help them to remember that your word did say that the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion an everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning will flee away. Oh God, restore to them, Lord, the joy. Hallelujah. Even in this time of sorrow and pain and to everyone that is grieving and, and hurting in some form or the other, dear God. Even on this platform, dear God, speak peace, speak joy. Oh, no. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God, we want to tell you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not just a hearing God, but you're an answering God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
for being here with us tonight, dear God. Hallelujah. Continue to bless each and every one, Lord, until you bring us back again in sweet fellowship. Hallelujah. We continue to glorify and to praise and to honor you. For you alone is worthy. In this we pray and ask in no other name but in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Hallelujah name. for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Shatayama. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, the mics are free, are open, and everyone is free to make your expressions at this time. Amen. Amen. We Amen. resume Bible study on January the 9th and the second Monday night in January. Because the first is, I think the first is a Sunday, the Monday is the second, so... We resume on the night, that's the second Monday night in January. And please, brethren, for this holiday, make have some good fellowship with your family and friends. You know, please. You know, we have to live balanced lives. So oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Spend some balanced time with life. family and friends. Balanced life. Pastor <laughs> Willis went to church on Sunday. I don't know what he did this Saturday. But he did not go home back Sunday after church. My God. I'm just saying sometimes that we neglect doing that, spending quality time with our family and friends. Yeah. We don't know what the next moment is. So I'm going to say this again. Please spend some quality time with family and friends for this holiday. While we are praising the Lord, let's get some others. Join, with, with, join in with us. And just thank the Lord for his goodness. That's God right. bless you. And may I say, Shalom. Amen. 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 It's good. Blessings, everyone. Blessings. 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 Bless, Lord. Bless, Lord. Blessings. bless the Lord, everyone. Lord bless Lord. you. Lord. Bless the Lord, sister. Hallelujah. Uh, bless you all, brethren. It was a pleasure throughout the year and uh, closing off the year. We give God thanks and really and truly uh, for this type of fellowship that we have been sharing on this platform. And Amen. it was really a pleasure. God bless you, presenter tonight and each and every one that has been coming on. So, so wonderful. We have been bonding as a family. Praise yes. God. No yes. organization or barrier or anything God. like that. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise God. Glory to That's God. Right. That's right. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. God Thank bless you, Reverend Hill. Bishop Hill. Yes, man. Oh, only brother, only brother, only brother. Only brother. <laughs> only brother. Only brother. <laughs> God bless you. Um, I also want to say thank God for, apart from the teaching tonight, and uh, my dear sister, I also want to say thank God for the Collins, he also did a great job, and I'm just saying, my God, we have we have people who are armed with the knowledge of God, and it's it's it, it's a blessing to be on this platform and to learn so much. Glory amen. To God. amen, amen, amen. I know you didn't mention yourself, sir, but you started it off. So to God, uh, that's glory. Right, that's, right, right. that's right. That's right. Praise God. Yeah, you, notice, you notice him leave himself. Amen. Oh, Lord. Blessing, blessing, blessing. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you all. Shalom. Saints Shalom. God. God bless you all. Shalom. Shalom. Amen. God bless you. Love you all. God bless. God bless. Praise the Lord.